Hey Dublin Pal Youth, what is up? It's great to be studying with y'all again today. Uh, last week we looked at the return from exile. Uh, the Jews got to go home to Jerusalem under King Darius uh, when the Persians conquered Babylon. Uh, the Persian stance on conquered people was was different from the Babylonians. They they allowed them to go home and and continue work on rebuilding their temple, uh, which was a big deal to a lot of them. But not everyone went home. So today we are going to look at some of the Jewish people who remained uh, in Persia in the story of Esther. And today is Sunday, August 23rd. Let's get into it. Israelites left Babylon, many returning to Jerusalem, and some heading to surrounding countries. An Israelite named Mordecai moved to a country called Susa with his adopted daughter Esther. While they were there, the king of Susa, Xerxes, was looking for a woman to become queen. Young women from all over Susa, including Esther, were brought to live in the king's palace and go through a year of beauty treatments before the king would make his selection. When Esther finally got to meet King Xerxes, he was attracted to her more than any of the other women. So Xerxes placed a crown on Esther's head and made her queen. But Esther did not tell him that she was an Israelite, also called a Jew, because Mordecai asked her not to, fearing his reaction. One day, Esther's father Mordecai was sitting near the king's gate and overheard two of the king's officers planning to kill the king. So he warned Esther, and Esther told King Xerxes. The king's life was saved, and the two men were executed. Shortly after, King Xerxes promoted one of his men, named Haman, to a position higher than all the other officials. He commanded everyone to bow down as Haman entered each day through the king's gate. But Mordecai refused. When Haman saw this, he was furious and even more angry when he found out from some of his officials that Mordecai was an Israelite. So he looked for a way to kill not only Mordecai, but all of the Israelites living in Susa. He convinced King Xerxes to declare a law, stating that all Israelites living in the region would be killed on a specific day because they would not follow the king's laws. When Mordecai heard about the law, he tore his clothing and wept bitterly. He convinced Esther to go before the king, reveal that she was an Israelite, and ask the king to spare her people. There was one problem. No one, not even the queen, was allowed to come before the king uninvited. If they did, they risked being put to death. But Esther was brave and approached the king who asked, what is your request? Esther said that she wished for the king to host a banquet and to make sure that Haman, the man who wanted to kill the Israelites, was there. At the banquet, she would make her request known. When the day of the banquet came, everyone, including Haman, was there. The king asked Esther what it was that she wanted. She revealed that she was an Israelite, a Jew, and begged for her own life and the lives of her people. The king was furious with Haman, who had convinced him to create the law and had him arrested and killed. Then King Xerxes not only removed the law to kill the Israelites, but gave all of them living in the region protection and rights. Because of Esther's bravery, the Israelites were spared and even honored. So like I said, King Darius had allowed the Israelites to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. But Persia remains very much in control. Israel is not independent at this point. And many of those who were in exile decided to stay in their foreign homes instead of going back home to Jerusalem. Now, one of those is Esther, a young Jewish woman who is cared for by her uncle and adopted father, Mordecai. Uh, and they live in the Persian capital of Susa. 
Now, King Xerxes is a Persian king who succeeded Darius and was married to Queen Vashti. <laughs> Up until Queen Vashti refused to come and show herself off, uh, show her beauty to, to his noblemen at, at a drunken banquet, um, which was taken to be an insult to the king. So as a result, Vashti had her, her royal office stripped away. Um, and eventually it was decided that the king needed a new queen. So, of course, what are they going to do but have super terrible Persian bachelor uh, to figure out who the new queen will be? It was literally a beauty contest. Like, it was the thing that it was the thing out of fairy tales. Uh, all the all the fine, finest young virgins from around the kingdom came to Susa uh, to basically see if King Xerxes would choose them. Now, this story kind of shows the really precarious position uh, that women and really anyone in, in King, Dar or King Xerxes' court held. Um, your position, your life, your freedom was all dependent on the whims of the king. Now, I mentioned this is like Bachelor, but the stakes are so much higher. Now, it is just as trashy and gross, but the loser... Uh, instead of bowing out and getting interviewed on the on the season finale, stays in the brothel forever. Um, basically, people who weren't chosen by the king were brought back to the king's brothel, and unless the king called for her by name, uh, that's where she would remain pretty much for the rest of her life. So Esther was selected for this contest, and Mordecai told her while she was there to not reveal that she was a Jew, lest she face discrimination, as many in Susa didn't like the Jews. Now, Esther immediately gets the support of Xerxes' eunuch, who is in charge of his brothel, and with his help, she wins the competition. So with that, Esther is the queen of Persia, uh, and Mordecai stays close by. And it's good that he does, because one day while he's outside the palace gate, he overhears guards discussing an assassination attempt against King Xerxes. And Mordecai warns Esther, who warns Xerxes, uh, and she tells him that, you know, Mordecai said this to me, that these men are going to kill you. And they investigated and found it was true. Uh, and the men who were going to kill the king were executed. Now, at the same time that all this is going on, there is a hateful, hateful man named Haman, son of Hamadatha, who is a rising star in Xerxes' court. Everyone bowed before Haman, except Mordecai the Jew, who would not bow to anyone but God. Now, Haman is enraged by this. He's a pretty fragile man. He's got a lot of feelings. He's got a, a big ego uh, based on this position of power he has in the kingdom. He's got a lot of political power that he got really quickly. And he just wants everyone to tell him how great he is. Uh, and Haman is so mad that Mordecai won't bow down to him that he plans to destroy all of the Jewish people out of revenge. And he convinces King Xerxes to sign off on basically a genocide. Now, Mordecai hears about this, and he, he tears his robes and, and screams, and, and he goes to find Esther, basically telling her through one of her servants uh, to reveal her heritage to King Xerxes and beg for mercy for the Jewish people. Now, the tricky part is, no one can appear before the king without being invited, and at this point, Esther hadn't gone before the king in about a month. If you entered the king's chamber without being summoned, he could either extend his scepter to you or not. And if he doesn't extend his scepter, you were killed. So Esther asks Mordecai to gather all the Jews in Susa to pray and fast while she does the same for three days. And at the end of that, she'll go to the king. Now, when Esther appears before the king, he extends his scepter to her, sparing her life, and asks her what her request is. He says, anything you ask, up to half my kingdom. Esther invites the king and Haman to a banquet the next day. And at that banquet, he asks her again, what, what is it you want up to half my kingdom? It is yours. And Esther says, all I want is for you to come to another banquet tomorrow, you and Haman, and I'll tell you then what my request is. Now, the night before, or the night, sorry, the night after the first banquet, Haman is so overcome with his hatred for Mordecai. He says, the, the king uh, invited only me to join him at this banquet that Esther prepared. 
And yet I can't even enjoy it because that Mordecai will not bow down to me. Imagine the fragility of someone to, to feel so enraged by, by one perceived slight that, that not even great things, wonderful parties with the king of Persia are enough to make you let it go. So <laughs> the, that night after the first banquet, Haman tells his men to set up a pole 50 feet high to impale Mordecai in the morning. But that night, King Xerxes couldn't sleep. So, you know, he did what any poor sleepy boy would do. He has the book of the Chronicles uh, that detail every record of his reign read to him as a bedtime story. Yeah, I never got that bedtime story growing up. I don't know. Maybe it's just because I wasn't the ruler of a vast empire. I don't know. Kind of a weird bedtime story, but hey, it works for him. So that night, he just happened to hear about Big Thana and Teresh, the would-be assassins who were exposed by Mordecai earlier in our story, saving the king's life. Now Xerxes asked, what did, what did we do to honor Mordecai for saving my life? And is told, nothing, not, nothing was done. So Mordecai calls in Haman, who had been waiting outside uh, to ask the king to let him kill Mordecai. And you see in Esther 6, starting in verse 6, when Haman entered, the king asked him, what should be done for the man the king delights to honor? Now Haman thought to himself, who is there that the king would rather honor than me? So he answered the king, for the man the king delights to honor, have them bring a royal robe so the king, that the king has worn, and a horse that the king has ridden, one with a royal crest placed on its head. Then let the robe and horse be entrusted to one of the king's most noble princes. Let them robe the man the king delights to honor, and lead him on the horse through the city streets, proclaiming before him, This is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. Go at once, the king commanded Haman. Get the robe and the horse and do just as you have suggested for Mordecai the Jew, who sits at the king's gate. Do not neglect anything you have recommended. So Haman got the robe and the horse. He robed Mordecai and led him on horseback through the city streets, proclaiming before him, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. Can you imagine what Haman's thinking at this point? He walks in thinking he's describing, you know, his own party. He's planning his own party with the king. And it turns out the man the king wants to honor is the very man that Haman was planning to kill that day. And now, at the king's command, Haman has to shower upon Mordecai all the honors that he wanted for himself. And it gets better. At the second banquet... When King Xerxes asks Queen Esther what she wants, the queen tells him that she is Jewish and that Haman has conspired to massacre all of her people. And King Xerxes is enraged and orders Haman to be executed. Ironically, on the very same pole he had had set up for Mordecai, the Jewish people were spared. So that's the story of Esther. And so what? Well, I love the story of Esther because it's a story of people being used by God in circumstances that must have seemed so far from him right up until the moment that his great plan was revealed. Esther had to be terrified to face Xerxes and either win his favor or be imprisoned in his harem forever. Mordecai must have been terrified for his adopted daughter, and then so much more scared for her when her husband ordered all of the Jewish people to be killed. But all the while, God was working each and every detail to perfectly set up this salvation for his people in Persia, and bringing the most ironic justice down on the man who was plotting against them. Sometimes it's hard to see what God's doing in our lives. It's hard to see what situation he has us in. Especially when we aren't made queen of Persia in order to stop a genocide of our people, but we just go through our lives and we face happy times and sad times and hardship and pain and joy and suffering. And, and we don't always get to see how that ties into God's story while we're here in this life. 
But we're told over and over again in the Bible that God has a plan for his people, that he has his upper story that we get to be a part of. It's just our job to trust and follow him. So let's pray for that before we go. Dear Lord, we praise you because you are God, because you are in control of all things, and because you have a beautiful upper story that we are so grateful to get to be a part of. Give us the faith that we need, Lord, so that when we, like Esther and Mordecai, are faced with scary, seemingly impossible situations, that we will know that you are in control and that you will see us through. Thank you, Lord, for this great story and most of all for Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that was it. That was my one of my favorite uh, parts of this story, the story of Esther. Uh, thanks for joining me, and we will study again next week. Grace and peace. I